name is Arnold Branham. And um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about just about your life history and about some of the philosophies that you and um, Lorraine had when you were younger. And well, I was born in Nashville, Wisconsin, which is a village near Crandon, Wisconsin, 1926. Uh, as far as I know, it was at home, home birth. My father had a store in Nashville, the only store there, and above was the living quarters. And uh, I was born there. And when I was six months old, while my family and me were gone somewhere for the evening, the store were caught fire and the whole building burned down. And so we had no home. And uh, I, as far as I know now, my father moved and built a store, in, or had a store in Salt Lake for a year and then he came back to Wisconsin. And I grew up more or less in that area. Um, went to school in Cranon, kindergarten. And uh, then my father moved to Kentucky because he wanted to uh, have a sawmill there. He had a tract of land with a lot of oak timber on it. He wanted to make lumber for barrel staves for liquor. It was a good market. <clears throat> well, I was about six years old at that time when they uh, started to look into the timber they found that it was uh, pin oak and it had uh, wormholes in it, all through it, little tiny ones. So it couldn't be used for oh, barrel staves. Yeah. And so they had to uh, sell it at a much lower price anywhere they could. My brother Ivan was his salesman. And uh, while we were there going through all that, <clears throat> my dad in his uh, 60s, found another woman and took up with her. And uh, mother found out about it and she left, it took me of course with her and my brother Dennis. We moved back to Wisconsin and my brother Cecil uh, had a little uh, house between Pelican and Lake and Elko in, in Wisconsin and 40 acres of land in a barn, and uh, he turned that over to us, and we lived there while I was, till I was about 12, 13 years old, and uh, lived on what my brothers and sisters could give us in the way of money, mainly about ten dollars a month each from four of them, and we had a big garden, and I was forced to hoe, horrible thing. <laughs> and uh, when I was growing up there, we uh, I played around there and uh, out on a lake a mile in the country out in the woods called uh, Perch Lake and I learned to swim by falling off a log in the, in the water and uh, then uh, we moved to Three Lakes. I had my first year of high school there. And there was a store a couple owned in Three Lakes, a grocery store, was being operated by them and they had to go out, they went out west for a vacation and Myrtle took it over for the winter. So I helped around the store and we had a little house rented there with an outdoor privy, colder than devil in the wintertime. <laughs> and then we moved to uh, Eagle River and uh, we had a, a place there and I, my brother Cecil built a sawmill there and but we moved from there to, to Rhinelander and bought a home in Rhinelander, Johnson Street. And I went to high school in 
Brian Ender graduated from high school there. I, my eyes, when I was born, were uh, the muscles in my eyelids did not develop. So I was born blind. My eyes didn't open. And until about a, six weeks after I was born, they opened just a little bit. And uh, I struggled with that most of my years, for many years, with nearsightedness. And we had a barn and a cow and a calf and a horse, an Indian pony that uh, would as soon kick you as look at you. And I learned to ride on that. And uh, we, my brother Dennis went to, with his brother Bud, to Canada and then Alaska, and then they stayed there. He did. He finished school somewhere, and I graduated, and I went to Alaska for a year. After and high school. After high school, and my brother Bud came out and bought a, a plane, and I flew with him across Canada to Alaska. I had some adventures there, but I don't know how much you want to go into detail on something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, and uh, I learned to operate a weather station at Rainy Pass with the interior of Alaska where he had his lodge. And we reported the weather 18 hours a day, every hour. So because on the other side of Rainy Pass, they had to cross the mountains to get to the other side. And the planes had to go through a canyon or else over it. And the weather had to be known, otherwise they'd get caught. So we reported the weather, and I helped guide hunters, the bear, brown bear, the, the big Alaskan brown bear, and black bear, moose, and caribou, all over the area. And uh, I shot one while I was there also. We trapped while I was there. We had a team of dogs, and most of them were uh, huskies. I learned to drive a dog team. I had one incident where uh, I was going out to check some traps from the lodge and the dogs were running down the trail. I was on the sled behind and they saw a, a porcupine and it was riding down the trail ahead of them and they took off after it and I couldn't stop them. And I tramped on the snow brake but it wouldn't do no good. and the, the animal ran up a spruce tree about six, seven feet high to the top, and the dogs went around the tree in a circle, and there I was. And we, uh, fi I finally got them extricated, didn't get quills in me. That's one of the things that happened. And we, I was there a year. We trapped beaver, and I had to go out and uh, dig holes in the ice. It had snowed heavily. And the snow was at least six feet on the level. And you get off of snow shoes and down you'd go. And, uh, so we had to contend with that. And there was a lot of ice on the ponds, beaver ponds. But we managed to get our limit of beaver. And they were ex well priced at that time. A good big beaver would be $75 for his pelt. But you had to skin it right there while it, while it was warm, if you, if you got it there in time, or come home and thaw it out. And uh, when it was 30, 40 below, it was hard work to do that without freezing. Anyway, after a year, I came back to Wisconsin, and I was there. I hadn't been to church for a year, but I got a call on a mission. And I didn't have no desire to go. But to please my mother, I decided to go. And in Salt Lake, I got a temple blessing, and I told the uh, member of the 70 that interviewed me that I really didn't want to go on a mission. I probably would come home in six months, and he gave me his phone number and, and smiled and said, if you decide you want to come home, you call me. <laughs> and I went to uh, Washington on my mission, and after a few months of nothing but tracting, uh, I finally began to get a testimony, which I had not had up to that time. And after about a year, I had a good, good testimony and was able to be effective as a missionary. 
and we learned the Anderson plan there, which is the uh, thing they are still using in a modified form of teaching the gospel. And after my mission, uh, I had uh, come in contact with a chiropractor there who would help me with my back because while I was in Alaska, I had an airplane wreck. My young friend and I were in April 24th, and there was sunshine most of the day and night at that time. And we took off from a Piper Cub from the lodge on the lake on ice to retrieve traps. While we were flying up the uh, valley, uh, ascending canyon, the uh, plane stalled, and he tried to climb and come back. Instead of, and the plane turned over and came straight down and uh, hit a snowbank about four or five foot deep and broke in two right behind me. I was the passenger and we went out, I went out the window, side window, and he uh, stayed in the plane. The gas tank was right by his knees and he bent the gas tank double with his knees, but it didn't break his knees. I don't know why, I don't know. And I had cuts all over my face and was unconscious, and we got out of it all right. My brother flew over in his plane later on, thought we were dead until we came out. So after I got back and called on the mission and went on a mission to Washington, I spent two years doing uh, missionary work there. I learned the Anderson Plan, learned scripture. I got so I could uh, memorize and repeat chapter and verse and about three to five hundred scriptures. So I could hand my Bible to whoever the prospective investigator was, and while he was reading that, quoting the scripture, and tell him all about it. And it was quite effective. Anyway, after the mission, I came back. To Wisconsin and I decided to go to chiropractic school and that was in Seattle, Washington. So we went there and I found lodging with a, a Mormon family, the nice people, and went to college there for two years and I was about half, two-thirds of the way through and uh, when I received my call for the Army. And what year was that? <coughs> About 1949-50, thereabouts, something like that. Korean War, the early 50s, wasn't it? Yeah. And I would, I'd just gotten married to Luray in this Idaho Falls Temple. And six weeks after we were married, I got the call, Army call. I had to quit school, quit and leave her go to California for basic training. And I took Signal Corps basic training and uh, didn't want to be in the Signal Corps. And we've got Luray to come. <coughs> we found a place to live in the San Miguel nearby and stayed there for a while with three other families in the house. And I hand carried my papers all around the Army Camp Roberts and got transferred to the Medical Corps. And uh, there I was sent, because I wanted to, to uh, um, physical therapy school in, in Texas, which is as close as I get to chiropractic. There I spent several months learning about that, and then they sent me to uh, San Francisco, to the Presidio, to get uh, training in a hospital. And I came back to Camp Roberts and practiced the uh, physical therapy there. Massage, diathermy, heat treatments, exercise on the people that they came. Most of them were ex-football players who had all kinds of injuries. Hmm. That and their uh, civilian families. And then I was uh, given a, a call to overseas to Japan because they said they needed physical therapists there. And I went over on a, on a boat 
and while on the, going over on the boat, there were 5,000 servicemen on one half and 500 officers on the other half. And we were crammed four high with steam pipes. I was on the top, steam pipe just above me. And so I got a job as a guard to the prisoners on deck so I could be on deck as much as possible. <laughs> and, uh, there we uh, put an a, a notice in the paper, another fellow and I, the ship paper that came out. If there was any other Mormons, we would hold a meeting. So we found a few others who were Mormons, and we held a couple of meetings while we were going to Japan. <laughs> and there I was sent to Sendai, Northern Honshu, and uh, they uh, found that the orders sending me there as a physical therapist had been, uh, the need had gone out months earlier, they forgot to rescind the order. So they didn't need physical therapists. So they gave me a choice of uh, working with uh, orthopedics or surgery. And I didn't want to do orthopedics, so I chose surgery, which I knew nothing about. They taught me a little bit, and uh, so I became a surgical technician with months I were there. And we also started a Sunday school class with a lieutenant who was a surgeon as the head, and I was a teacher. And we uh, converted two people while we were there. <laughs> and uh, then I went, came back on another boat, and Kevin w was soon to be born, so we went to, there was no place, nobody we could find in that area after I got out of the service. So we drove to Seattle to the Ray's folks' home. There we found a naturopath who could deliver. And so he came, and uh, although he wasn't the best at it, I helped him. And we had delivered Kevin, the first baby. And it was a, quite a job. And then we moved to there from there to Wisconsin, Eagle River where my brothers had a mill and uh, buying wood and I joined them, became the, the wood buyer, and took care of books and over a period of years we stayed there for many, quite a few years and I bought a home as you know. And, uh, delivered, I delivered all my kids, myself, and people learned about it. I was doing that, and uh, every once in a while somebody would call and say, would you help me? So I got into the home delivery business, not because I wanted to, <laughs> and uh, couldn't charge anything because uh, it was illegal at that time. So I just went where the, when the need arose and uh, learned something from uh, a couple of books I had about it. And by practice, of course, much, a lot of prayer. And uh, eventually, I read a book on hypnosis, and I learned to, uh, in some cases, uh, I guess you'd say hypnotize. Hypno like hypnobirthing? Uh huh. Put them in a state where they were still able to have their contractions, but they didn't feel anything. Yeah, there's a whole class on it now called hypnobirthing. Uh -huh. Did you know that? No, I didn't know it. I figured <laughs> that was probably the first one that ever did it. <laughs> but it worked. I could put them uh, down and uh, tell them that we wake at a certain time and the birth would proceed all right, and it did. And, uh, I was amazed I could do it. Just absolutely amazed. I felt the Lord was behind me 100%. And that's how I got started in the uh, the home delivery business because of delivering our own children. You were one of them. Do mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you remember anything about what was told about that? Um, yeah. A little bit. No. Well, Angie and Robert uh, couldn't find anybody in Utah, so they drove all the way to Wisconsin so I could deliver the baby in the upstairs big room. And at that time I didn't know that Angie was prone to be a bleeder. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when you were born, it was not too much problem. Uh, she started bleeding from the inside, you know. 
and it was coming out pretty heavy and we were worried. What do we do? So uh, with a hurried compass, we found some red pepper and uh, I think over a period of a few seconds, we gave her probably at least a tablespoonful, a spoonful at a time. And within a few short time, the bleeding stopped. Hmm. And she was saved, she would have died. And uh, the raised mother was there, the bleeding started. Uh, she was horrified and left, and the raised sister was there. She fainted. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was quite a time. But then Tara was born. Mm -hmm. What else? So tell, tell me about some of the deliveries that you went on that you remember. What are the most? Well, I had various ones. Uh, one uh, man and woman who had a, the flower shop in town had uh, several kids, they had eight or ten of them, and two of them wanted me to deliver their babies. And uh, I, at that, by that time I had begun giving classes before the birth started to teach the woman how to relax, and what was going to happen, and how to prepare for it. And uh, one of these girls, I think I delivered either three or four of her babies for her, and one was born in call. Do you know what that means? Yeah, with a sack. Huh? Yeah, inside the sack. Yeah, mm -hmm. And the head was out, and it hadn't broken. And I didn't know what to do, so I prayed about it. I figured I'd better get a sharp knife and prick it. And that head right there arm around it, why well, it was dangerous. And then and the Lord told me in no uncertain terms, leave it alone, don't, don't do it. And when the head came out and started to turn, it broke and the water gushed out. And then I had one where, uh, as I told you, the mother was very large, the baby was very large. And then when it was born, she tore in three or four places. And I had no way I could fix it, so I sent her to the hospital. And we got away with that all right. And before I got through, I was investigated by the medical profession in Wisconsin. And uh, they came and uh, talked to me and uh, wanted me to tell them what I was doing and, and what I was charging. And so I said, I'm charging nothing. I'm just helping with people who want me to help them. And they couldn't find anybody who would say anything about it against me, so they finally gave it up. <laughs> but it was, it was scary, scary for a while there. Mm. And later on, of course, it became more accepted. And, but at that time it was not. We were the pioneers. And all of my children and the babies I helped deliver were born with no deficiencies or problems. It took time. One was two days, but uh, they were all born successfully. And I, oh, that was the only one I had that had tears, because I learned to uh, uh, help avoid that by putting pressure on the perineum. And when the baby came out, where it nearly always tore in that area. Mm -hmm to keep it from being torn. But I learned by practice. And, and then after a while I got too busy. I was busy with the business, the, uh, buying and selling wood, mainly pulp wood. And uh, I had to travel all over northern Wisconsin and Michigan to do it. And we're raising ten kids besides. And it got too much for me. Then I was also in the district presidency of the district, I had to do the, lots of work on that, and I almost had a nervous breakdown, come very close to it. But I had too much, couldn't handle it. And uh, I was in the district presidency for 12 years. Oh. Mm. We traveled back and forth to Utah at least once a year to visit my mother and family who were in St. George, Utah. and. 
I pursued my business for there from the time I started with my brother Ivan until uh, Lorraine got sick. And in the process of time, we uh, started several branches of the church, which are still in existence and some are wards now. Wassel was one of them. I was helped there when it was a Sunday school. Wow. Uh, I helped start a branch. And we traveled in missionary or church work up to 12, 14,000 miles a year just on church work. Sundays we'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, to the family in the, in the station wagon, travel to Upper Michigan or Eau Claire or uh, Anywhere around the district, we had a large, a large district, bigger than most missions, and take care of the affairs of each branch that we went to. See, to put in new branch presidencies, or you know, all sorts of things. And Russell Waite, who had been a Seventh Day Adventist and had been converted to the church in Wausau, he became the first branch president in Wausau, and also the counselor. He and I, under my brother Cecil. And when uh, Cecil was released after all those years, Russell Wade became president and I became his counselor. And we were both released while I was in Salt Lake City. Did he know it till we got home? And, uh, <coughs> and we raised our ten kids there. In Eagle River? Out of Eagle River, four miles. Mm -hmm. We all went to school there. And uh, of course, they're all married now. I don't know. There's a lot of story, you know. You go, but do you want any more? Well, um, can you tell me a little, tell us a little bit about Ray? What she, what led her into national she, health, and what you did? The Ray was uh, uh, had had uh, what's that disease where your heart is like rheumatic fever? Rheumatic fever when she was little, twice. And uh, she got a recurrence of it after we were married in Eagle River, and her sister Jean came to help while she was ill. And uh, we, of course, were trying to follow natural ways, and, and being ill like that, she turned to nutrition. And we wanted to learn more about nutrition, and we started a health food store at our home. And what year was that? Must have been the late 1950s. Uh, only one in the whole area, but uh, it was out in the country at our home. We built a special room with a walk-in cooler, and uh, she got to meet a man in Rhinelander who had uh, started developing his own brand of uh, supplements, and he had a laboratory and between Three Lakes and Eagle River, and my wife went to help him. And uh, they developed our own brand called ANL Natural Foods. And we sold those and others also out of the health food store. Never made a living at it, of course, I made a living out of the wood business. But uh, she wants what she wanted to do. And over a period of years, I sent her to. Uh, school with the doctor, what's his name? And Dr. Christopher. Yeah, and she got a degree in uh, herbal, herbology. And she never would try to practice it from a financial standpoint, but she people would call up and she'd tell them what to do for free. <laughs> so we never made any money out of it. But uh, it helped with her, what business we had there. And we raised all of the boys and girls there. They went to high school. And uh, all of them graduated and went their various ways. And none of them ever went into my business. The close we got to it was Kerry. And we put him in the garage. We had a business where we bought and sold forest products. And I uh, went out in the woods all over northern Wisconsin contacted loggers 
and we had as high as a hundred different loggers at a time. And uh, we would finance their logging operations, and they would pay us back when the wood was shipped. We had control of the shipping. And uh, I traveled all over the woods seeing these people, getting to know all of them. I also traveled to the mills, got to know the wood buyers, joined the American Pulpit Association, and uh, became very active in it because it fur furthered our business. Mm, got to know them by their first names. And we financed loggers to the tune of anywhere up to half a million dollars in the summer. And the mill uh, advanced us money. At first, they, they would give us a contract, say, for 100,000 cords. We just to just write a letter, no contract. Because the buyer knew us, we knew him. But then when he retired, then they became uh, official, and we had to sign contracts. And uh, the mill made the contracts so that it was binding if we had to furnish all the wood. If they didn't want it all, it, it was non-binding. And we had all kinds of trouble with them over that. And I uh, had to deal with all the loggers, make sure they paid back their bills. We had lost very little money because we had control of the shipping. They had to ship through us. But I would go out and scale the wood in the woods, figure out what it was, what it looked like, whether it was proper or not. So I spent a lot of time in the woods, tramping up and down the logging roads, driving in with a four-wheel drive vehicle I always had, with a plow on it in the wintertime. And uh, all lots of adventures with that. And the only one that we might be worth saying about was Potter and Gamble had a big mill in Green Bay called Charmin Paper Products. And they produced Charmin toilet paper and paper, you know, all that stuff. And the mill decided they needed a lot of wood. They couldn't get enough of the sap peel, that is, the bark peeled off. So they decided they wanted to buy some rough wood and machine peel it at the mill. And they gave me us a contract. And we put in pulpwood landings all over northern Wisconsin and Michigan. And maybe a logger would pile a thousand cords up in the woods. I would go check it, scale it in the woods. And when the, mill, the wood was trucked into the mill, if the uh, truck scale didn't meet or exceed the scale I get, we had to pay them. If it exceeded it, then they would pay us back the difference. And I was good enough with it that uh, we didn't have any problems. Until one year, the mill decided they didn't want the wood after it was piled up in the woods. And they started talking about the, you sell it somewhere else, which was impossible. And so uh, another big supplier who was much bigger than us and Michigan called Sawyer Soul Timber Company. We were the two main suppliers for Charmin, Botter and Gamble. And we got together, their head man and I, and decided that we would go beard the lion in his den, that is the wood buyer in Green Bay. And uh, so I wrote a letter telling them our position and stating that uh, if they uh, didn't honor the contract and take the wood, uh, then uh, we would quit producing wood immediately and they could go whistle for it, which was very drastic. Think, we both agreed to it and we drove down there without announcing we were coming. We went to see the wood buyers, two of them, and I gave them the letter and they read it. And uh, the head buyer looked at me and said, Arnold, I know, you, I know you wrote this. You know what you're doing. And Yes, I said, I know, but you're destroying our business. And we ended up, they took our wood. They said, if we ever do that again, I'll murder you personally. <laughs> and uh, over the years, we had a lot of troubles like that. I, I set up a, a wood buying place in Michigan, Mass, Michigan, on an old railroad spur that I had renovated, and I bought the whole thing because I figured the mill later on might want to quit buying wood and I'd be stuck with the place. So I made provision there that uh, if, uh, in, in writing with the mill, that if they quit buying, 
they had to buy the, the yard, the wood yard lot, themselves. And they did, they quit eventually. And uh, I sold the lot to them and made about $20,000 on it. <laughs> so we didn't lose it, but it. And eventually, everybody got sick, as you know, and we found she had uh, bone marrow cancer. And I took her to Salt Lake City, the best medical advice I could get, sent her to Mexico where they were supposed to have therapies. None of it worked. So I finally contacted a place in Germany who claimed to have success, and I took her to Germany and spent several weeks there. And they sent us home with a bunch of uh, drugs or stuff. And six weeks after we got back, she died. And all my kids were that were generally were there, and I was too. Uh, that was a hard life trying to happen. And then I went. After that, I decided I didn't want to work anymore. I was in my early sixties, so uh, we turned the business over to my brother Ivan's son. Eventually, made a deal with him and they sold it to him very cheaply. And I went to St. George, Utah, where my sister Myrtle was, and with my daughter Aurora, who was still in school. Stayed there a couple of years, and then uh, with the ray gone, I was very unhappy. And I learned about, through a friend, about uh, Betty, who lost her husband several years earlier, and was living there. I had known her because I was in the district residency and seen her in the hallways. That's all I knew about her, except I thought she was a beautiful woman. And uh, I got, and I just waited two weeks to get her on my mind after I heard about her. And why, I don't know. And uh, would wake up in the morning thinking about her. Finally, I uh, called her and uh, suggested I come and visit her. And she said, all right, I'm not getting married to anybody. <laughs> so I went to visit her, and uh, we seemed to get along quite well. And uh, went back to Utah, and I visited her again in midsummer, and we got engaged. And the third time we went, we got married. <laughs> Not in the temple because I'd been sealed to the ray, but by the branch president here, who subsequently died, and we moved into this home. And I took care of Myrtle for several years, as you know, and, and she died. And uh, Betty and I have now been married 21 and a half years, and Myrtle is gone. I'm the last of the Radicals. Number 12. I have a half-sister, Brenda, who lives in Kentucky, who I'm very close to. We, we love each other. And I talked to her every two weeks. I've been to see her a number of times. Very fine woman. And, uh, that's about all I can think of. So, um, did you have any breach deliveries in your... None. Movement? I was worried about it. It <laughs> never happened. Mm -hmm. I had read about how to turn them. But, uh, was been willing to try it, but I didn't have to, thank goodness. Mm. Some of the deliveries were very, very long. It took a long time. And as you know, when a, when a woman is, is giving birth, she gets to a point where it's, she can't decide whether she's going to do it or quit. Mm -hmm. It happened to me a number of times. That's why I developed hypnosis. You, know, you either had to do that or talk them through it or something. And, See, I delivered some of my own grandkids, Amber, Aurora, Christy, several of hers. And, uh, then my family has been very supportive of my efforts. And Betty and I are still together at 84 and 86, and figure we'll stay together until one of us goes. <laughs> That's, and that's, you have to ask some questions. That's all I can think of. Um, so, what did you do about or about bleeding besides you told me about my mom? Did you have any? That was the only 
case I had of ex really extreme bleeding, I used the red pepper by mouth. Did you did you carry certain herbs with you, just in case, or? No, uh -uh. no. I did uh, meet with the prospective mother several times before the birth and coach her on the procedures, what would happen, and how to. Uh, react to it and how to relax. And got their husbands to help in each case, and massage their backs, you know, and be there as support. Whereas in most cases, in the doctors, the hospitals, they don't allow the husbands in at all. Maybe they do now, I don't know. Yeah, they do now. But I did it on all of them. I refused to do it unless the husband would participate. And did you have any other assistant there besides? Any what? Any other assistant attendant there with you besides the husband? Or? Well, sometimes there was another person. In my own children, uh, the last three or four, I had uh, Vi Dutcher, whose husband, Art Dutcher, was my close friend. She was a nurse. She would come once in a while if I asked her to. And, this, and also uh, some peaceful people that we got into the church, the Krogels, uh, his wife was a nurse. And she would come also to help, not with the actual birth, but assist in every way they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, always cut the cord ourselves, mm -hmm. and took care of uh, all the things that needed to be taken care of. I wasn't very good at uh, diapering. <laughs> what did you use to cut the cord with? Scissors. It's some surgical scissors. Mm -hmm. Waited until the pulsation ceased, and then cut it. Mm -hmm. And we put a bandage over the uh, baby's place so that it would uh, disintegrate, rot, you know, and, or whatever you call it. Is it umbilical stump? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you give any kind of prenatal care, or did they go somewhere for prenatal care? I had urged them to go to a doctor at least once or twice before the baby was born, so they could get confirmation of things were all right. Other than that, I would see them two or three times before the baby came, and uh, talk to them, as far as I could tell, whether the baby was all right or not, and that was all. Did you do any kind of monitoring, like fetal heart monitoring? No. I didn't have a Seth scoop or anything. It was uh, all very personal. Just a lot of trust. And I got to, uh, I found that if I got to know the woman closely and she learned to trust me, that was the most important thing. If the trust was there, it would go all right. Without that, it wouldn't go. So I had a close association with each one. And I encouraged, if the mother of the woman wanted to come in, be there, that was fine. And I wanted the husband there. And the circumstances, an atmosphere of love. Nobody there that didn't have love. That's is the important thing. And I did a lot of praying. Did you have any serious complications? Other than that one that they tore oh, an awful that. lot. Mm -hmm. And I had another baby that was born that was quite large, took a long time, but she was able to bear it without any problems. And I can't say I had any major problems with any of them. About what were the approximate years that you were doing that time range? Let's see. Summer. When was Aurora born? She's 40 now. When would that be? Uh, 1971. Mm -hmm. Just before she was born, I think, we, uh, was when I started in the early, around 1970, probably. Uh, for a few years after that. 
And of course, our, over a period of years, ours were born, too. And tell me about the doctor that came to those births. Dr. Colgan uh, was an old man at that time, and he came, see, Kevin was born in St. George, but the rest were born in, no, Kevin was born in Utah, or Utah, no, Seattle. But Corey was born in St. George, and the rest of them were born here, Eagle River, here, I mean, not in Eagle River, the home there. And then Dr. Colgan came for the first one, and he had to go up the stairs. He had a hard time making it. So uh, he said, Arnold, you know how to do this. You deliver him, I'll sign the papers. <laughs> so we would go to him for a prenatal check now and then, once or twice maybe, and then I would deliver the babies. And he signed the papers. So did he even, he didn't come to the birth then? Just mm -hmm. sign the papers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. did he do that for the women outside of your family that no. delivered? What did you do for birth certificates? They had them get their own. We taught, showed them how to do it, explained it to them. They can get their own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, no, I didn't have any problem that way. But I had the problem with the investigation. That took over a period of a year. They came to see me twice. They, I, I knew they were traveling around the area asking questions, trying to find some way of uh, in, indicting me. On practicing medicine? Yeah, without a license. But they couldn't prove I was practicing anything because I was there. As, I was only there to help as needed. And they couldn't prove I'd done anything wrong. They even saw some of the women I'd never been before and they wouldn't say nothing. <laughs> they were too happy with the result. So, so I got away with it. I wouldn't do it again. No. So. About how many women did you, or how many babies? I really don't know. Probably maybe 40. Altogether, count my own. But I didn't really want to do it. But couldn't refuse when somebody come and see. I just can't afford it, or I can't, don't want to go to the hospital, don't want to go to a doctor. And then Christy helped the last time or two I did it, or three, and then she took over after that, and I quit. And she had probably more deliveries than I did. And I don't think she ever had any failures either. Now I am uh, 86 years old and still practicing nutrition to a certain extent, taking lots of supplements, and still able to ride a bicycle and drive a car. And I've got a very, very good wife who takes care of me. Is that enough? So, so can you say one more statement before? <laughs> um, there's a campaign, the, the MANA campaign called I'm a Midwife campaign. So can you say my name is Arnold and I'm a midwife? Oh, uh, yeah. My oldest daughter, Angie, her oldest child, Tara. No, no, I want you to say, my name is Arnold and I'm a midwife. Oh. <laughs> I, I want you to say that statement. Okay. As I mentioned in the beginning, my name is Arnold Branham. I, uh, my vocation was a commission agent buying pulp wood for paper mills and, uh, and uh, logs also and other things. I did that for 40 years and I became not a midwife, a mid-husband. <laughs> and, uh, so because of uh, I didn't, we, my wife didn't want to go to the hospital to deliver the babies at home. <laughs> Others found out about it and wanted my my help, and so I became uh, perforce a person who delivered babies, a male person. Uh, I don't know if there are any nowadays or not. There's a few male midwives uh, around. Uh -huh. So say, my name is Arnold and I'm a mid-husband. Okay, my name is Arnold Branham and I am a mid-husband, not a mid-wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. You want to say something, Betty? No. Thank you. Oh. Okay, there.
when I was a young man, when I was, uh, I went to college at the University of Utah for two years. I never graduated, but while there, I was very much interested in music, so I joined the Ward Choir. I joined the University Choir. The University Choir Director was the Assistant Director of the Tabernacle Choir. And uh, through him I got an interview with the Choir Director and to try to join the choir. And he talked to me a couple of minutes, smiled at me, he said, Arnold, why don't you take some get some lessons? And he figured he was done with me. So I went back to the University of Utah talked to the choir director, and he gave me lessons for two three months. And then I went back to see the Tabernacle Choir Director, and he let me in. And for that year I was a member of the Tabernacle Choir. So I belonged to three choirs, the Ward Choir, the Tabernacle Choir, and the University of Utah Choir. And we practiced on Thursday night, sang on Sunday morning, and, uh, of course, I've kept my interest in music all my life. It's passed on to my kids. All of them play piano one way or another. And all of them like music, I think, and still do. And I've sang in the church choirs and solos and most of all, all, of, all of my life, just about. <clears throat> you really want a, a verse? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. That's enough. Thank you. <laughs>